two, one, press the button. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks very much for, for joining us. I'm Michael Brand and I'm going to be presenting this session. Uh, Lisa Davies and Catherine Morley from the British Council are going to be supporting. They're going to be monitoring the, the question box and we're going to be looking at the, the questions at the end of the session. So there will be some time, some time for that. OK, um, a couple of housekeeping things. The slides for, to this presentation um, are available in a Dropbox. Uh, the British Council will also be making them available, but the Dropbox um, address is on the screen. So if you want to take a screenshot or make a note of that, that's where you'll be able to get the, the slides from. OK. So that you know something about me who's talking to you. Um, I'm, I'm Michael and I'm a teacher trainer for Pearson. I previously worked in secondary schools in England and Spain. And as a teacher, I prepared students for exams, um, Cambridge exams and the university entrance exam in Spain. And back in England, I prepared French and German GCSEs and A-levels, or I prepared the students for, for their GCSEs and A-levels, OK? As well as being a teacher trainer for Pearson, I'm a, I'm a teacher on a live classes project. So this is a project um, which, which is, is, is online classes. So you teach online lessons to, to 10 to up to 10 groups of students from around the world. And they all, you know, they all link English is kind of the lingua franca. So we're all practicing our English together. Um, and the, the classes for 2021, 2022 will be up on the website in a week. They're not there yet. But um, if anyone's interested in taking their class to an online lesson and getting them practicing their English with students from Serbia, Lithuania, Greece, Mexico, Japan and Italy and 80 other countries I think have attended, you're very welcome to. So so you can, that's a, this is a personal invite to attend a live class at some point this year if you'd like to. OK, good. But today we're, we're talking about exam classes and these are some of the considerations I think for exam classes. So first of all, when you're teaching an exam class, just as in a general English course, you're teaching English language, that's to say grammar and vocabulary and uh, being able to use it across the four skills in ways outlined by the common European framework. OK, nevertheless, the exam will have certain requirements and question types that students need to contend with and need to be prepared for. So maybe they've had practice writing essays in the past, but they've never written a report in their lives and they need to in the exam, OK? So they need strategies and skills to approach exam tasks, which hopefully mirror real life. This is inevitably more the case for some exam tasks than for others. They'll also need functional language for exam tasks and, and lots of practice, OK? So how much of each of these ingredients do they need? Well, it depends on the students, of course. Sometimes you get students who do have the language level but need to refine their exam technique. But most of the times they do need language teaching too. Um, nonetheless, today we're actually going to focus largely on the exam technique side of things, OK? With all this exam technique and pressure, we do want to keep our classes and get engaged and keen. Um, some students might have their laser, a laser focus on their goal of getting their certification, but that's as, as I found, it's not the case with everybody. So even if you do have to do a bit of teaching to the test, you can still do it in a, fu in a fun way. So in this talk, I'm going to look at the requirements of some of the tasks in the B2 first exam, suggest some of the language and skills the students need and propose activities to develop and practice this language and these skills. OK, so I suppose many of you, if you've signed up to this to this session, you might prepare students for this exam. But if you prepare students for other exams, I do hope that the activities uh, will be relevant to you as well. OK. OK, good. So let's get started with uh, with the practical ideas, which is the main body of the talk. OK, I'm going to start off with a listening part one, which is a multiple choice question. You can see a multiple choice question here on the on the screen. OK. Now, these are some of the things that the students need to be able to do in order to do well in this question. Need to be able to spot agreement, uh, purpose, speaker's purpose, uh, spot a speaker's attitude and uh, an opinion and spot a speaker's feelings as well. So they'll need to be taught these areas, taught language and clues to look out for and get practice, okay? 
So I'm going to give you give you an example. OK, I'll just give you a second just to have a quick read of the, the question. OK. OK. Good, so this is an activity from a from from a from a book, but I'm going to read out the utterances myself and you can identify how how I'm feeling. OK, off we go. I can't believe you said that it's unacceptable. It's so hard to work when there's such a lot of noise in the house. Three, I really can't wait to start my new job. Four, it's a good thing I booked ahead. The hotel's completely full now. Five, it'll be a tough thing to do, but I guess it's not impossible if I really try hard. And six, it's raining. Do I really have to go to the shops right now? OK, I'm not going to I'm not going to re read out the answers. I guess I guess you're able to spot them um, without too much difficulty. And you, what led you to getting the answers would have partly been the language, but also uh, the tone and the intonation that you heard in my voice. OK, so that would be a practice task. That would be sort of spotting the kind of language and clues that, that, that give you the answer. And then we can do some um, we can move on uh, and uh, the students can try an activity like this one. OK, so I explain how this activity works. Um, if you look on the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you've got some feelings cards and you deal these what the deal these out to your students. So each one has a has a feeling card. OK, and they need to demonstrate that 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 feeling in the conversation we're out. We're about to have uh, without using the word of the feeling and the other students have to have to guess how they're feeling. OK, so we have a short conversation about a topic. Topic could be anything. It could be this. Could be this, could be this, or even this. You know, you can you can use the the uh, things that your students are interested in. So students get a short time to prepare some things to say on the topic, which demonstrate their feeling. I can't mention it as we said, and then they have conversations, and the aim is to guess the other people's feeling. Okay, and they can make notes on what the others say, and then guess at the end, with classmates confirming or denying. For example, if I said, I can't believe salmon, salmon is 18 euros a kilo. How am I supposed to afford that? You know, any guesses? Well, how I'm how I'm feeling? Uh, well, that would be that would be the annoyed one. OK. And and um, from from their notes, they can they can assess us, others on how they convey the feeling and, and suggest alternatives too. Now you can also teach the language for turn taking, asking opinions, etc. But we're going to move on to speaking parts later on. OK, so we just started with an activity to practice the idea of identifying feelings. OK, these could also be attitude cards as well. Um, it, it, the, the activity works for a number of different sort of identification skills. OK. OK, good. We're going to move on. We're going to look at a writing question. Uh, the essay, which is compulsory so comp uh, in the, the B2 first. OK. So for any exam writing tasks and indeed writing tasks in general um, and some speaking tasks, models are really useful to give students um, an idea of what they're aiming for. And typically we'll, we'll critically analyze a model pick out useful language or look at the structure employed for when we do our own answer. Now students should use language and phrases from the models. It's by putting them into practice that they learn them and the phrases become their own. You know, I had some students say, well, no, it was cheating to use that. And it's no, 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 I want you to use that. That's that, that that's the idea of showing your model. OK, so here I've got a model of an essay and I've blanked out the boxes which describe the structure and pick out devices. I blank these out on the presentation tool. Uh, on the interactive whiteboard software, uh, you can use this in online classes and I'm going to have my students read the essay and predict what's behind the blue boxes. So predict what the advice is um, to make the activity more active. OK. Or I can just use the pen tool to hide a few words. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm creating an activity out of the writing model. So I'll just let you have a look through the what's hidden behind the black pen um, 
to see if you to see if you can work out what the what the advice is around writing an essay. OK, so so I wonder if you got them uh, there they are. All, all is revealed. Um, so having had a look at a model, students will need like, explicit teaching on on the on these areas. So that is to say activities that develop structuring and writing, a good introduction and conclusion, how to connect ideas within a paragraph, words that help signpost structure and work on writing complex sentences i.e. rather than very short ones, and work on writing impersonal sentences rather than saying I and we all the way through the essays, OK? So what I've got here is a rubric. So as well as models, students can be provided with and scored according to rubrics. So this is an example of a slightly more student friendly rubric. The examiner's version has been simplified. There are more examples of what meta language means and the levels are defined as solid, good and acing it. Um, even so, this rubric will be more me meaningful for students once they've covered the different areas in class. So if you look at the examples for tone uh, with the blue square that I've just uh, flashed up, is things like passive, not using contractions, impersonal language, things we've hopefully covered in our lessons. And looking at the blue boxes on the right, they're about linkers, which help with cohesion, uh, with linking ideas. And if you have a quick look at the blue boxes on the right, you'll see that the students need to use a variety of these, i.e. not write on the other hand, four times in the essay, which my students used to do before I demanded more variety. Um, so I'd like to demonstrate an activity that can that can help with this. OK, and I'm, I'm going to need a I'm going to need a partner uh, for this. So, so Catherine, are you there, Catherine? Hello, yes, I'm here. Oh, lovely, Catherine. Thanks. Thanks for joining me. OK, so uh, let's. Me, what me and Catherine are going to do is we're going to choose um, from each of the five sets of three words. We're going to choose uh, an option, OK, and we're going to write it down on our on our notebook. OK, so I'm going to I'm going to do that now. Number one, I've made my choice. Number two. OK. OK, how are you doing, Catherine? Yes, I'm ready. OK, so M M Catherine and I, what we're going to do is we're going to try and guess each other's each other's words. Um, but we have to we have to read out the essay um, from the from the start. And when we get to one of the three, the first three, I will guess Catherine's word. If, if I've got it right, she'll tell me and I carry on. If it's wrong, well, uh, then it's her turn to start again from the beginning. OK, we can't write down what we find out about each other's words. We have to remember them. OK, so OK, all right, let's let's I'll, I'll, I'll get cracking then. It is very important to learn different languages in the modern world. This essay will uh, discuss. Yes. Yeah, OK, the best ways to learn a new language. It is clear. No. Ah, OK, never mind. It's Catherine's turn. Um, it is very important to learn different languages in the modern world. Um, this essay will consider. Yes, it is. The best ways to learn a new language. Uh, it is undeniable. I'm afraid not, Catherine. No, my turn. It's very important to learn new languages in the world. This essay will discuss uh, the best ways to learn a new language. It is evident. Yes. Ah. That traveling to another country is an excellent way to improve your language and skills. You have to speak the language every day in order to communicate and you can also make new friends. However. No. Aye. Your turn, Catherine. <laughs> OK. Um, 
it is very important to learn different languages in the modern world. Um, this essay will consider. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, the best ways to learn a new language. Um, it is clear. I'm afraid not, no. OK, so then it'll be my turn again uh, and and I would have to remember what I got right from last time and 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 wrong and try to get to the end. Well, we'll call it a day there, Catherine. Thanks very much for your for your for your support there. So okay. what it is, is we, we call that activity a memory race and it's a race to get to the end of the to get to the end of the to the essay. OK, uh, remembering what your partner put for each of the each of the sets of words. I was a drill activity. It's just it's just reading, but it's. It's one of those activities that if you explain, it doesn't sound that much fun, but I've done this with my students with uh, prep, prep, prep for essays and they'll really they'll really get into it, um, really trying to remember what their partner got and they'll get so close to the end and then they'll make a mistake and oh, it's so frustrating. You got to go back to the start. But the the idea is that for each of the sets, I've given three different alternatives for, you know, linkers or, or set phrases in the essay and and then my homework my students are going to go away uh, for homework and they're going to write an essay and i'm going to say no i don't want any i, I don't want any linker to appear more than once You've, we've been working on a variety of linkers in that activity are we to put in the that into practice in your own essays at home okay so that's just a a practical activity to try to develop um a varied use of linkers okay so that's an activity for the for the writing part of the exam uh we're going to move on OK, we're going to move on. So uh, which part of the exam is this? I'll just have a quick look at the what I've got on the screen. See if you can spot the part of the exam. You may have noticed that this is reading and use of English part three, uh, which is which is a word formation task. OK, that's the one that we're going to look at uh, next. All right. OK, so this is a fact sheet for students about this this part of the exam and it includes a checklist checklist to see if they're exam ready. Now I've cunningly blanked out the first two steps that students should take when confronting a task like this. Now just that you have a look at all the different steps and have a think in your mind. Any idea what this the first two steps might be? What's under the blue box? Well, there we go. It's it's reading the text for gist and thinking about the type of word that you need. So my students used to just plunge straight into the text, straight into the activity, trying to transform the words without even you know, reading the text, um, but getting a general understanding and looking at sentence level before word level it really helps them do well, do well on this on this activity. So with that in mind, um, we can get our students into good habits in class. We can only show them the title of the text and get them to talk about it. What do they know? Um, we can give students the text and cover the words on the right. And again, I've used my, my presentation tool to just blank them out. What type of word are they expecting in each gap and why? OK. I can get the students to read the text quickly. Uh, and see what they found out about uh, about the topic. Is it surprising? Is it aligned with their predictions? The sorts of things you usually do in reading activities. OK. And then we can, you know, use the task in a, as an exam prep activity, which I'll get on to. Now, you might argue that doing sort of lead in tasks to activate schemata isn't active in an exam situation. So why would you do it in class? But it is important for students to read through the text quickly before starting into the, fill in the gaps because they do need to understand the general meaning and the type of word they're looking for. Um, but if you just tell them to read quickly without a task, then they might not do it. So that's a reason to sort of build uh, build this habit in, in class, I would say. OK, so that's part of it, you know, um, reading the te task text. What am I what am I looking for? The next the next part of this type of task is is knowing different forms of words, right? You need to know the noun and the adjective, the different parts of speech. So what kind of things can you do to develop develop that? Well, when you're teaching new vocabulary, you can brainstorm words that can be derived from the same root. So you can give them 30 seconds to come up with as many as they can. 
for example, if you're teaching apply for university, what other words can we form from apply? Everyone can write down what they know. When a few seconds have passed, they can tell their partner. When they've done that, perhaps a pair can tell another pair. OK, for example, um, you can also get your so you might have come up with application, applicable, applicant, applied, etc. Um, you can also tell your students to put an extra column in their notebooks and set it as a homework task to brainstorm other forms. So you've got your, your vocabulary you've learned in your lesson and then they go away for homework and see if they can find out, find other, find other forms and then come back the next lesson and, and share what they've what they've found. OK. Um, when revising vocabulary, uh, don't just settle with recalling the items, asking le us learners to, uh, to form other words from them. And they can they can make sentences with their new form so that they can see the differences in meaning too. Um, and finally, there's lots of games you can play around this type of word formation tasks. A typical one is is word tennis. So you've got them in two teams and somebody stands up and serves and says apply. And then the other team have got three seconds for somebody to stand up and hit the ball back and say applicant. Then the other that goes back and the other team have got a few seconds to hit it back and you, they can do the tennis movement and say application until a team can't return and uh, it's it's 15 love or, or what have you. So word tennis is one thing you can uh, play here and, and that can be played obviously not just with word formation with just about anything, uh, any kind of brainstorming or ideas. Other things, um, other things you can do, other other ideas. Uh, this is noughts and crosses. So here we've got um, uh, we're focusing on prefixes. And um, so you the students are in two teams and to get a square, you have to choose the right prefix and use the word in a compound sentence. So for example, if I if I went for my team went for precise, I might say and it's imprecise and say yes. Can you use that in a sentence that shows you know what it means? Uh, yes, he said he would arrive sometime tomorrow, which was imprecise. Well done. You can put your cross on it. OK, so that'd be a game of noughts and crosses and it's getting 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 the right the right form, the right prefix and using in a sentence. Um, this is an example of a game you can play that that takes longer and has multiple teams. So you get you get a bit more out of it than than with the noughts and crosses. So I've got a big, a big kind of big um, grid of words and, and I've got four different teams, for example, and a team chooses, chooses a space. Um, uh, let's say the one that says kind, let's say I'm the crosses team and I, I choose kind and I say I think the noun is kindness. Um, and and they say yep yeah, in a sentence and I say, well. I didn't have any money, so my friend and my friend uh, paid for my cinema ticket, which was a real, which was real kindness, an act of kindness. OK, I get my cross and it goes on to the next team. And, and once you've got your once you've got three, three in a row, then you can um, you, you get you get a point. OK, so we so it's about where you choose to go on the grid, depending on what you, your team can do and, you know, um, strategically so you can get you can get three in a row. So it's another way of it's kind of a variation on the theme of of noughts and crosses. OK. And again, this sort of game you can play, I'm using in the context of you know, word formation, but it could be it could be mistakes. You could have 100 mistakes in a grid and if you can correct the mistake, then you can get you can put your little um, mark on it and then it's another team's turn to choose a different square so it could be used in other in other contexts as well okay um, or it could just be that you choose a square and how many words how many forms can you make out of it and use in a sentence and you get points accordingly so if I chose refresh and said refreshment refreshing and refreshingly and use them in a sentence then I'd you know I'd get three points for my team okay um, Excuse me. Um, on to the next activity, which is called a gap fill gamble. Um, and this is a game you can play with any gap fill task. It's kind of a checking game, really, more than a teaching or, or doing in a practicing game. It's a checking game. 
so the way the way it works is well we've done our we've done our reading the students in this case have done the activity on their own and then they're going to we're going to go over the answers and the students have got a little in a pair a pair of students sitting sitting down and, and they we get to the first question and they both write on their piece of paper what they think the answer is okay uh, secretly from the other and they put them on the table in front of them face down and then the answer is revealed if one person gets the paper and the if one person gets it right has the right answer and the other one gets it wrong then the two bits of paper go to the one who got it right but if they've both got it the question wrong or they both got it right then it's a draw and the bits of paper stay in the pot until we get on to the second question they both write what they think the answer is on their on their paper put them in the middle the answer's revealed and again if one of them's got it right this time and the last one was a draw well then that person will get the four bits of paper but if they've both got it right or they've both got it wrong the paper stays in the pot and we move on to the third question so it's um it's a it's a it's a, it's just a, a memorable checking game let's say it makes checking quite memorable so hoping we can get the answers to uh, to stick okay okay moving on to our next activity with um with prefixes thinking about word formation this is an activity i think which originally comes from mark hancock um uh, to do with pronunciation and i've also seen nikki unsworth use it to talk about word formation and i think it's a good one and i wanted to share it basically you have to decide which city are you going to you've got to decide where you're where where we're going and i've got some got some british cities up at the top here and i'm just going to read out four words and you've got to decide if that word takes a miss or a dis at the start of it what prefix does it take if i were to read out four words and they all took miss you would go left 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 and the answer would be london if i were to read out four words and they all took this you would go right 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 and you'd end up in belfast if i were to read out four words and it, they went miss this miss this well you would go left right left right and you'd end up in Gla in uh, in glasgow okay so you got to judge the words so we're actually gonna we can we can practice this uh we can do this game um so uh first one to decide whether to go left or right is understanding okay understanding second one is advantage next one is loyal And the next one is read. So it goes understanding, advantage, loyal, and read. I wonder which city, which city are we, which city are we in? Anyone think that they know? Well, it's misunderstanding, disadvantage, um, disloyal, and misread. So that means we're in Sheffield. So if anyone thought Sheffield was the answer, then then they, they got it right. OK, and you know, the teacher can prepare this activity and the students can actually prepare it as well. If you tell them how it works and the type of words they need, they can prepare it for each other. And this can work with anything binary. So anything we have to choose one one option or the other. So it could be words that take in or un. Um, I think it was originally used for minimal pairs and pronunciation. Um, uh, you know, it could be, does this take the gerund or the infinitive? That's another topic that we sometimes cover in our courses. OK, OK, good. So that was just a section on the on the word formation. Um, and we looked at using the text as a text and then some some kind of games and activities we can do for, for practice. All right, um, let's move on. Let's move on. I'm just going to check how much time we're 29 we're, we're doing okay we're, we're doing all right for time um okay so let's move on to another question in the reading and use of english section uh this time it's a reading task namely multiple matching and we've got we've got 10 statements and four texts and we need to decide which text mentions each of the statements now to do well in this question students need to be able to scan for specific information spot implication and know when things are not explicitly stated 
notice paraphrase and recognize opinion or attitude and this is again a recurring theme we've seen this already in the talk so we're going to look at some activities to develop just one of these areas which is paraphrasing and questions okay so here's an explanation of what paraphrase is all right so just let you have a let you let you read it read what's on the screen and think if you can give you a chance to sort of match up the the, the stem in the question So, so looking at that, you know, light would be sunshine. The trigger is as soon as odd itchy spots is, is the illness, etc. OK, so the, the, if you spotted those words, you'd be able to get the question right in the exam. OK. Um, so have a read of, of exercise. Um, let's have a look. Exercise, exercise two here. OK. So you're going to read two sections of an article about the effect daylight has on animals and people. Read the exam focus and before reading the sections, look at questions one to five and identify key words. What might you expect to find? So if you look at one, number one, a concern for the survival of some animals. What sort of words might you expect to find when somebody's talking about a concern for the survival of some animals, but doesn't use those words? OK, and then we can we can brainstorm that. And, you know, your students might come up with something like uh, worry or anxious or extinct or die or maybe names of animals. OK, so this is sort of this is developing the skill of spotting, spotting paraphrase and spotting synonyms. OK. Um, we can model, we can model ourselves and, and, and upgrade how our students record vocabulary. So bound up in recognizing paraphrase is recognizing synonyms and antonyms for that matter. So eliciting and pointing them out as part of our general teaching practice is, is good practice. But we can also use paraphrase and synonyms in our, expl uh, in our expl explanations, excuse me, to the class. So for example, right, listen up guys, time for a bit of quiet. Let's turn down the noise, yeah? Sit down, take a seat, take the weight off your feet. Oh, hilarious, Juan, you, you crack me up, side-splittingly funny, OK? So I'm, I'm not advocating repeating everything we say in class three times um, in a different way and turning our class into some kind of riddle, you know, particularly not with beginners. But we are our students' main language input um, and we can therefore actively consider what sort of language to expose them to. So sometimes giving them sort of two or three for the price of one uh, does, does make sense, yeah? And of course, if we do do this, we can also explain why we're doing it to our exam students. You know, we want them to appreciate the importance of recognizing and having at their disposal a range of synonyms, both for success in exams and for general language learning as well. So we do want to put the onus on our students um, and we, we, like I said, we want them to get to the stage of writing down different parts of speech and then beyond that, noting related synonyms and antonyms. And, and if you get your students really into this, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll say, oh, what was that other one you said there, sir? You know, and the, the keen ones will, will be there getting it down, realising why you're doing it. OK. OK, on to the next activity um, to do with uh developing uh, synonyms and, and and paraphrase okay this uh, i'm going to call this um, i call this uh, synonyms memory game so so imagine imagine we've just read a text imagine we've just we're, we're in class and we've just read a text and i want to kind of get the most out of the language in the in the text i want the language in the text to, to stick what I'm going to do is I'm going to read out one at a time a synonym, antonym or paraphrase of 10 words or phrases from the text. So I'm going to read these out. The students try to remember the word that, that, that the, the teacher is referencing from the text or use a, a word or phrase they know. OK, 
but the students don't write them down as as the teachers reading them out. They try to hold the answers in their heads. Who can remember the most? OK, so we're actually going to try it here. We're going to have a go. Uh, um, you can do this at home um, in, in your heads. Now you haven't actually read read the text, but you have, so you haven't been exposed to the original vocabulary, but as English teachers, I'm sure you'll be OK. So, so how many words can you keep in your head? Don't, don't write them down or put them in the chat box. Just keep them in your head. OK. Number one means the same as fortunately. Number two means the same as in a bad mood. OK, you got two words in your head. Number three, a synonym of funny. Number four, the opposite of low point. Number five, means the same as defenseless. Number six, the opposite of very ugly. Number seven, a synonym of set off for a trip. Number eight, means the same as become happier. Number nine, the opposite of sunrise. Number 10, it means when you look at something for a long time. So we've all got 10 words in our minds, yeah? Catherine, hold up your hand and tell me how many words you've got in your in your mind with, with, with your hand. How many of you can you remember? Seven. Oh, that's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, yeah, so good. Catherine's obviously got a good memory. Um, uh, so so you tend to find uh, I, doing this a few times. Teenagers normally can remember more than more than adults, actually. I've done this with teachers and they remember maybe five or so. Um, so I go around the students seeing what we can remember, uh, seeing seeing the words that we can remember. Now, these are the right answers, as it were. These are the answers that came from the text, which which, you know, which we didn't read. Um, so we can but we can. Um, we can we can we can show these to our students, but also we can add the add the uh, the ideas that they came up with if they did if their words went out of the text. We can discuss to what extent they are direct synonyms or any any differences in differences in differences in meaning. OK, now if you just th if you think about that, that tech that activity we just did, if you could just say, right, read the text and then do the do the do the um, do the exercise where you find the 10 words in the text based on, you know, my uh, paraphrase or opposite or whatever. But just the what we did here with the kind of reading them out and the memory made it into a made it into a game. We've just we've just turned it into a game. How many can you hold in your head? You know, and it requires real, real concentration. Um, but but they, they do get pretty into it. I've, I, I used to find uh, uh, students in activities uh, such as this one. OK. It's a synonym synonym memory game. Um, OK, good. Good, so I want to uh, let's say finish with uh, looking at a couple of activities for the speaking part of the exam. So just like Goldilocks likes her porridge perfect, so do I. Uh, and I'm very lucky to count on a great porridge chef at home who you can see in the picture on the screen here. OK, he always does his porridge just right. And when answering the questions in part one of the exam, which are these sort of things that you can see on the screen at the moment, um, the right consistency of the answer here is an answer to the question backed up by a reason. So it's not a monosyllabic response and it's not launching into a sh pre learned Shakespearean monologue either which is some of the traps that, that candidates sometimes fall into. OK. So with that in mind. We can look at models, we can look at student answers for these questions, so I'll just let you have a quick look at the box. OK, so the first one again is, is the is the monologue and it's not it's not actually a, because it's pre learned and it's not a direct answer to the question. The second one is a bit a bit short and it and again not 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 directly answering. 
the third one is is probably it was that is, is the best response to this okay so in terms of language needed to answer these questions the language of being of giving a reason is useful so this is an activity which gives practice in that and also just like i'm i'm looking at uh, upgrading my say at ibiza to a Dodge Challenger SRT Hellcat at some point, as you can see in the picture, um, we can encourage our students to upgrade the language that they use in these types of questions. So move away from safe verbs and adjectives like went and nice to, for example, some of the language proposed in the box here. OK. We can also give them uh, useful functional language in the exam. So for example, in this in the first part of the exam, they might not have understood or might want something repeating. And uh, so of course we can give them language to 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 ask for, for repetition. Uh, so this kind of thing is useful in real life, of course, and in general classroom contexts when the students are speaking to the teacher and to one another. And in other contexts. So my my daughter used to say, What? And now she says, Sorry, what was that, my dear daddy? You know, thanks to my, thanks to my my exam training with her, um, and so you want our students saying what in the exam wouldn't create the best impression. Okay, so, um, you know, these types of questions in in part one they can go they can go in a they can go in a box in a classroom. You can have you can ha you can have them there, questions uh, part one speaking questions in a box on a piece of paper. And and you can use them periodically. So so all the pupils go to the box, they take out a question and they mingle and they find a partner, ask the question, the partner answers. You can give them feedback, i.e. is it relevant and have you developed with the detail? Any upgrade ideas? Then the partner uh, asks you their question, you answer, they give you feedback. Then you swap your bit of paper and go to somebody else and uh, and ask them the piece of paper that you now have. OK, so you're practicing with different questions. A different way of doing this is that they all get a piece of paper. They go and find a partner and instead of asking their question, they answer their own question and then the partner has to work out what the question was based on their answer. And that gets them um, close listening to each other. Because sometimes with, it, with these sort of practice speaking questions, uh, you might they might not listen to the other person's answer. But if you if if you've got a task, which could be giving feedback or it could be working out what the question was, you're more likely to listen. Okay. And then when when can you use this? Well, these these little slips in a box. It can be used for for, for fillers, for for warmers. It can be used when students are coming into class. Maybe some students have arrived and some haven't. And it can be right. No time to waste. Get to the box and get practicing. Yeah. OK, good, um, good. And then you can provide them with some kind of fact sheet, which is what I've got here um, so they know what they're being assessed on, what they're what they're meant to do functionally and you have a checklist for assessment. OK. OK, finally, how are we doing? We're 43. We're OK. I think we're, we're, we're just about on time. Uh, I want to talk about the part two of the, the exam, which is where the students have to um, compare compared to two pictures um, and then they have to ask a question so both candidates do that and then they have to answer a question on their partner's pictures which relates to, to them okay so some of the things they need to be able to do for um, need to be able to do for this they need to be able to compare the, the language of comparison language of speculation what might be happening in the picture they need to be able to give a structured answer and as far as possible speak sort of um, for a minute in a, in, a, in a structured coherent way. Then when they're given a question on their partner's picture, they need to be able to give a detail to that follow up question. And it may be that they've got something in their picture they don't know the word for and have to be have to be able to deal with that. So these are some of the things they're going to need to be able to do. So um, let's just let's have a quick look at those things. Um, first of all, comparing. Well, we can scaffold the language of comparison. We can get them, first of all, writing down comparisons, uh, filling in gaps about two pictures and talk, sort of taking away the support, getting them to do it in speaking. 
um, and then hopefully when they then go to to do the do the activity without any support they'll be using phrases like in the first photograph um, this is happening but in the second photograph this is happening the friends look they seem to be etc they'll also need language of speculation which is language like this modal verbs um, practice with modals is very useful for the picture question they might be doing this it's possible that they're doing that uh, I think they're thinking this I think they're wondering that okay language of speculation organizing your answer well again a, a model is useful for that um, picking up the picking out here the best uh, the best kind of signposting phrase the best linker to to organize and then hopefully putting into practice afterwards um, and then giving detail to a follow-up question okay and, and here is again using candidate answers to the follow-up question and deciding which one is the best okay so if you look at this question a is the best because it's a personal response b uh, they're still talking about the picture which is not what they're supposed to be doing okay now it may be that they they don't know the word for something so you're there in an exam you're supposed to be talking about a picture and uh and ah there's a you know there's a word that you don't understand you think well ah, panic stations and so we, we want um to talk to our students beforehand so that they don't enter into panic um when something appears in a picture that they don't know how to say you know what what do you if you think about in your your mother tongue what do you what do you when you, there's a word in your mind and you can't think of it what do you what do you say i mean in english sometimes we say hey, you know that, that thingamajig uh, what's it, yeah, that thing thingamajig and uh, my mum used the word ujimawawa when she she said what's that is that that ujimawawa i don't know if that's if she's the only person in the world who says that or if there's anyone else in the session today who ever uses ujimawawa in spanish you might say something like uh un cachivache or el no sé qué, you know the i don't know what i don't know that they're the best strategies for the exam i'm not suggesting my students be talking about thingamajigs um they want phrases to be able to talk around something okay for a paraphrase okay or just to say that they've forgotten the word for it so there's an activity here which is which is an example of that you know i I should know the word for this, but I can't remember at the moment. I'm sorry, my mind has gone blank and this can buy you a bit of time as well. Or if you look at the sixth one, I know it's something you use for writing with, but I've, uh, I can't remember the names. You're showing you know what it is, but you've not got the not got the word. A good way of practicing uh, this for this kind of skill is is to play taboo in this in the class where students have to uh, define a word to their to their class without using some some forbidden words okay so it's good practice for this to play to play taboo okay on to what i hope is a fun practice idea um and the last the last the last idea i'm going to show you i'm going to gradually reveal some pictures and and as i do i want you to speculate and compare the two pictures so what could be happening in this pic these pictures what could it be a picture of um, what's uh, what can you how does the first picture compare to the second one and I'm going to reveal them slowly okay here we go now you can talk to yourself here or you can write in write in the chat box let's get speculating to yourself There you go. So I went a bit faster at the end because I know we're nearly, nearly finished. OK, so there's similar theme. They're both at weddings, as you can see. The method of transport is a bit different. You can see the one on the left is um, is a bit, you know, maybe a bit older. There's no mask in there. There's a mask. Someone's wearing a mask on the right one. It was taken more recently. The people on the right look to be enjoying them so a bit, selves a bit more. I the one on the left is me, and you can see that's another way of telling the photos a bit older. You can see I've had a bit more hair back then uh, than I do now um, and also I was a bit nervous because the donkey was a bit unpredictable it was uh, to, to the guy who's being led along and trying to trying to keep it still um, but anyway uh, you could do that in class as well with post-it notes taking post-it notes off pictures and they're speculating about the pictures okay practicing the language of speculation 
Um, students can use their own photos for these. It doesn't have to be from the course book, using magazines and travel guides to, to compare the two photos too. Okay, so it's it's that's 50 minutes bang on. So I think we've we've um, we've just about we're, we're fitting fit into the time. I right, thank thank everybody who's come to the session, and I hope I've given you a few ideas for your exam classes and your building exam skills, uh, and and, um, and and exam language as well. Uh, particularly thinking about B2 first, but I think that the activities are relevant for different levels and hopefully different exams too. The I took my material from uh, Pearson course, which is formula, which you can see on the screen in front of you. OK, from the exam trainer at the bottom is where I got most of my material from, from the B2 level. And just uh, before I draw to a close, I'm going to encourage everybody to um, to go to this URL, um, which is uh, tinyurl.com slash reader details. And it's just um, if you'd like to be added to to, to the Pearson um, mailing list, um, you, you you can do so and you you'll get um, as a thank you 60 free days access to to these to these readers. OK, um, so if you're interested in that, please do please to go to the URL and uh, you know and fill those in. OK, um, and that brings me to the end. So I'm going to I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I don't know if uh, shall I hand back to to Catherine and Lisa. Anything else to add before you? I know you've got your part to do there, Lisa. Hi, I think there were, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Lisa, do you want to ask the question from the chat? Sure, yes. Yeah. So um, somebody's asked with pair work. You, so you mentioned quite a lot of activities that involve pair work. And obviously, in the strange situation that we find ourselves in, um, this teacher has six students in class and two online. So have you got any tips with handling pair work activities in this kind of hybrid situation? <laughs> Oh yeah, I mean, I think there's 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 different things you can do. So obviously, if you've got two online, then they they can work as a, a pair online, and you can be in the class. But then it's just you you need to, of course, set them up on that set them up on the task, and then make sure that you you go back to that pair online and get some feedback for them um, from them, just um, just to make sure uh, that uh, you know that they've they've done the task. And also, I like as well you do with hybrid teaching wherever possible it's not just the students you know the students who are at home can do their thing and the students in classroom can do their thing in it is it possible to set up a pair task where you've got somebody in the in the classroom working at the computer with uh, with with somebody at home as well um to to kind of try to create that bond between those who are at home and those uh, those are those who are in the room um so i'll probably say th those two things and answer the question Thank you. Um, we have one final question that's just come in. Um, she says, I'm in an academy with two different groups doing first this year. The students range, range in age from 13 to 18. Most are in class, but in one class, two are online, and we will be using the book complete. More or less, how much content should I use per hour of class? I think we might be missing some information about how long the, the course is and how many hours of instruction they have but I don't know if you have any thoughts on that um I don't know if they if does it relate does that question relate to the course the course book complete it does say we're using the book complete mm -hmm. uh it's because I don't I don't know the um I don't know the course so it's it's hard for me to say how much of it should be used um in an hour yeah I think it depends a little bit on um, we need a bit more information maybe about the level of students and the length of the course and and so on. Yeah, I mean, I would just say for some for something like that, it's how you know how much material should you should you use? Like we, you, you go with your plan, you go with your plan and then you get into the lesson and then you're you're, you're teaching and you're concept checking and you're ass assessing for learning, seeing what the students get and and, and and if you know as you're going along that well the students they haven't got this and they haven't don't understand this and they need a bit more practice so i would say my answer to that would be probably you have it's flexible depending on what your students understand and get through because i mean i've i've worked in some schools and 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 it's been right you've got to get through this book in the year and 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 any and even if sometimes that's unrealistic they say no i don't mind just set it for homework get through it but the um, more important than how much you get through is how much you know they're learning and, and understanding. So I would say that's like the guiding principle in terms of how much you content you kind of get through. 
if that if that makes sense. OK, that's great. Thank you, Michael. And the last one, um, Carlos is asking if there's going to be an A2 set of materials this year. I'm not sure if he's referring to a particular course book or. Yeah, I don't know if he's referring. I mean, I, the, I, I, I took my examples from from formula, um, which is uh, which it, for, to begin with is B1, B2, and C1. There are, there, there, I mean, of course, there are other, there are other courses for A2. For, a Pearson course would be Gold Experience, which is a teen course for A2 or Gold. But the one I used is begins at B1. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's great, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So um, I'm going to come live now and just wrap up um, with some final words. Um, obviously, thank you very much to Michael for his talk. Um, I think you've given us great, um, great advice and a lot of practical tips that we can uh, we can start using from day one if you are preparing students for exams. Thank you all um, very much for attending today's 2021. Um, we hope that we've given you, as I said, some practical tips and some food for thought. You can do so by just clicking on the link that was sent to you for that session. Uh, materials that speakers have chosen to share from their sessions will be available on our Padlet. Um, and recordings will also be available on our YouTube channel shortly. I will just um, put into the chat here the link to the Padlet in case you haven't got that. Um, one exception will be the sessions that were workshops. Those sessions uh, were not recorded because they were done in breakout rooms. Um, we would also really appreciate your feedback on today's conference and we'd be really grateful if you could fill in a short online questionnaire. I believe Catherine has just posted that into the Q&A chat, so scroll up to find that. And um, we'd also like to thank the publishers who support. And uh, thank you all to the conference team for their work in organising today's conference. Um, don't forget that in addition to all of the speakers materials and recordings that will be available, there are other British Council materials that we have been highlighting today. So first of all, there are materials related to the Glasgow COP26, which takes place in November, and many teaching resources available on our websites, teachingenglish.org.uk, Learn English Kids and Learn English Teens. OK, so enjoy the rest of your Saturday. We hope to see you back at our next Teaching for Success conference in 2022, when we shall hopefully be able to do this face to face. Thank you very much and goodbye.